Hi everyone, I'm Jerome McDonald. I host Worldview on WBEZ. It's on from 12 to 1 every weekday. And um, I've become quite friendly with Ted Fishman uh, over the years. We talked about his previous book, China Inc. And now this one, Shock of Grey. We've done a couple kind of swipes at it on my program. And I'm delighted to be here and talking with Ted today about the book. Delighted to be with you, Jerome. Um, Worldview is one of my favorite shows. My friends all over the world listen to it on the web. <laughs> That's great. Um, this book, this Shock of Grey book, is kind of an outgrowth of China, Inc. Uh, could you explain how a, a book about China got you into aging? You know, now when I go around talking about the book, people go, oh, well, Ted, you're a demographer. You know, I'm not a demographer, but, you know, my opinion, but I'm really not a demographer. I'm just uh, um, the guy who wants to read a book like this. Uh, when I wrote uh, China, Inc., uh, I would go to China to the places that you need to go to understand business in China, which are the big powerhouse industrial cities. And, you know, it just struck me over and over again how flush with youth they are. And then you'd come home back to your American city, you'd fly in, and the place you used to think was big and vibrant and bustling, you know, Chicago famously is the city on the make. And it seems like a little older, <laughs> a little slower. And then uh, the employment statistics in the US, in Europe, uh, in elsewhere in East Asia tell you that you know, there's a huge employment problem with older workers. They're not old people, but they're older workers, 50 plus. And I was wondering whether the youth that was pouring into the cities, you know, on the trails of a trillion or maybe now it's two trillion dollars of foreign capital flying into China uh, to attract young people to Chinese cities uh, to work in factories that serve the world had something to do with this disemployment and disenfranchisement of older workers elsewhere in the world in more mature workplaces. And, um, I was interested in this question, was there a kind of massive form of age arbitrage going on around the world where the places that were expensive to employ people because they had these age-related expenses, you know, long vacations, higher salaries, big benefit packages, uh, that the world's capital was finding a way to shed that burden and move it to places where you can get hundreds, literally hundreds of millions of young people. And uh, China seemed to be that place. It was so successful at attracting young people to the cities, you know, uh, maybe now it's 200 million people have come off the Chinese countryside into Chinese cities, and you go into a Chinese factory, and I've been to hundreds of Chinese factories, um, the thing that seems like the most essential bit of employment information in the HR office of a Chinese factory is whether you're under 25. How can China stay young with a one-child policy? They are manufacturing themselves to, um, a grayer society. Yeah, well, China right now is one of the world's youngest places, but it's also, uh, ironically, it's one of the world's most rapidly aging. Um, so uh, demographers do talk about this one statistic, which is the dependency ratio, how many people are working uh, as compared to how many people need support from those working people. And then there's also the age dependency ratio, how many people are working for older people who need support. And, China is one of the lowest in the world right now, especially among industrialized countries. It's, it's 1 to 12, which means there are 12 workers for every person who needs support. But it also, as you know, is about a generation into, a little bit more than a generation into the one child per family policy. So the birth rate in China has been driven very, very low, which is the thing that makes your country age the fastest. And China is now a very rapidly aging country. Um, uh, sometime in this century, you know, it'll go from that 1 to 12 ratio to having about 30 percent of its population over 60, a huge and very, very rapid change, far faster than Japan went through the change. Uh, it's about four times the rate of change. Uh, this whipsaw ratio, though, is not going to be unusual, as we will see it play out in many countries. Uh, you mentioned Japan, but Spain is another, and uh, lots of others. Yeah, it seems to be almost a deterministic thing. You know, the, these often the places we think of as flush with youth, um, you know, developing countries are really quite rapidly aging. <clears throat> Um, Mexico will be an older country demographically than the United States uh, about two-thirds into this century if, if everything goes as, as we expect it to. Um, and I was just at this event in Aspen, the Aspen Environmental Forum, 
and the head of the UN Population Division was there, um, Hanya Zlotnik, and uh, she went through the UN's new numbers, which were just announced a few weeks ago. About 40% of the world is far below uh, or enough below uh, fertility, replacement fertility, uh, which means families are small enough to put them on this aging curve. About 40% are roughly at the replacement, and then just under 20% are growing. So this means that you know 40% of the world uh, is on its way to where Japan is today, where older places like Spain is today. 40% we don't know, and then all of the world's growth, population growth, will come from just about 18% <laughs> of the world's population. And uh, Japan it has the eye-popping statistic of being the first modern nation to shrink unrelated to war or disease. That's, um, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, um, it is amazing. It's amazing when you're there because young people talk about it. You know, if, if you're a young person in aging, aging Japan, you feel like you have to do everything you can to separate yourself socially from this aging country. So, you know, Tokyo's huge. You know, here we are in Chicago. Our metro area has around 9 million people. Tokyo has close to 40 million people. So there is a downtown Chicago for every kind of age group in Tokyo. You know, so there's a downtown Chicago for people 16 and under. <laughs> and uh, in the book, I talk about, you know, the kind of radical fashion statements that young people have in, in Japan to separate themselves from anything that has to do. And it's like several standard deviations uh, beyond Lady Gaga. Uh, <laughs> and then there's the downtown Chicago for the people over 70. Um, you know, and it's, it's a long walking mall where all of the curbs have been smoothed, where the street is smooth, where the shopkeepers have been briefed in how to be patient as people recount their change. <laughs> uh, it's the only McDonald's in Japan where you could bring your own sandwich. <laughs> because they found like if you can't let people bring their own sandwich, nobody goes. Uh, <laughs> But now they go and they sit and they sit and they sit. Um, uh, and you know, this, these, this is what can happen as a place ages, is that you get these radical shifts. Now, it happened in Japan, uh, I think, for the same reasons that are surprising elsewhere in the countries that really aggressively assert that they are pro-family, you know, that family means everything, it's part of our value. So in East Asia, in Southern Europe, uh, these are the places that when you talk to people, they say, f you know, we put family first. Family is always first. Every weekend is with family. We reserve Sundays for family. But the places that are the most professively pro-family also put the most burden on the women in the families. Um, so when women have an out from those burdens, either as daughter or daughter-in-law, uh, through education, through the accessibility of birth control, through the job market. Uh, they tend to take them in any way they can. So Japan did this very early in a surprising way. Uh, following World War II, uh, the Japanese were worried that mixed marriages between the Japanese and the GIs would create a, uh, a mongrel race. So they, they allowed for abortion laws. And when those abortion laws went into effect, Japanese women uh, uh, took advantage of that uh, possibility for themselves. And the Japanese baby boom, uh, unlike every other baby boom uh, post-World War II, it only lasted four years. And that's why Japan is ahead of the rest of the world demographically in terms of the aging, because its baby boom was so much shorter. I guess the thing that always strikes me as really scary about Japan is the way they don't have any immigrants. And in this country, if you go and look around at who's taking care of our elderly or that really need help, it is lots of immigrants. And we're importing nurses and we're importing doctors and everything in between. And in Japan, they don't import anybody. They rely on their family members. And this is crushing the, the whole situation even more. Yeah, that's exactly so. Um, they do have robots. Uh, and part of the Japanese robot industry is designed exactly to serve the lack of younger people who would otherwise fill in in these care, care jobs. So there's lots of household robots that will feed an older person at the table. And you see it mix, lift its robot arm and wait, and then the person goes forward. And, and they have all kinds of uh, household systems that monitor people. Um, but the immigrant situation in Japan is peculiar because 
politically, you can't be pro-immigrant. In fact, politically, you have to be very anti-immigrant. But when you drill down into the companies and you walk into a Japanese factory or into the Japanese field, you see a kind 